if you think one market's bad, you shouldn't be in that market. Find a great market to scale within that market, right? Focus is going to drive the returns, right? Diversification protects your assets, right? Focus on one thing is going to drive those returns for you. It's actually safer to have everything in one place because you really understand that market and like you really become the expert there. Like that is your moat. Welcome to the Patrick Real Estate Show, where we explore the fascinating world of real estate investing with your host, Patrick Switek. Patrick is a dynamic young entrepreneur and an accomplished real estate investor who's passionate about helping others achieve financial freedom. Each week, we sit down with some of the most inspiring individuals in the real estate industry and delve into their personal journeys, lessons learned, and secrets to their success. Let's dive into this week's episode. Michael, welcome to the Patrick Real Estate Show, man. I think you've built a very impressive portfolio across six years of short-term rental investing. It's been a sustainable growth. It's not a get rich overnight scheme, but it's been something that's been able to support you and your family living a very nice lifestyle in a city that's expensive like New York. And I think a lot of people that are listening, maybe living in an expensive city think, I can't build a portfolio on Airbnb to support my life here because it's just getting so darn expensive. But you've been able to do it so effectively uh, while raising two young kids, while doing a bunch of podcasting, sharing knowledge. You have 32 units total, six of them that you own and 26 arbitrage. And you use the arbitrage to support and allow you to buy real estate so that you can offset your income in general. Welcome to the show, Michael. I'm excited to dive in. Thanks, Patrick. That, you're way too kind with that introduction. I've never heard it described that way. I really thank you for introducing me to your audience. Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely, I think that just meeting you in person, first of all, I did not expect you to be so tall. <laughs> you're like really tall. And you're one of the nicest people I've met when it comes to just, you're just such a, like you true are, truly are like value, a hospitable person. I think the first time I met you was at, I've heard about you a lot online, of course, but I met you at STR Wealth Conference and you hosted a little meetup and you were just, you did the meetup and you were, it was the whole drinks on your tab. You were so welcoming. You just didn't even, you didn't know me that well, but you just welcomed me right away. It was just, it felt really good. And so I just knew hospitality is your thing. I appreciate really, that. Really cool. Well, um, you know, shout out to our mutual friend, Jeremy Warden. Uh, Jeremy oh, uh, told me about, hey, before the conference, he's hey, you should meet Patrick. He's a really good dude. I saw your social media. I was like, this guy runs a real business. So thank you for joining our little event at the One Hotel in Nashville. I'm glad you, I hope you had a good time. And oh, I'm yeah. glad we got connected and look forward to finding ways to work together. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is the first step forward because I do think you have a lot to share with the audience and I want to get into it. How did you even get started with short term rentals? What's your story? Yeah, look, this rewinds back to 2016. So really before Airbnb is what we know of it today, I was working as an investment banker in New York City. So I had a high paying, pretty intense job. I was eight, nine years in that career. So I was already a director and I had my wife, my now wife, then fiance, when we got, when we were talking about what we wanted, what we wanted our life to be and how we want to construct a life, a lot of it was like, how do we invest our time and our capital in a way that we can grow income for ourselves and take back control of our lives? And that was really the genesis of it. And we, so we looked at a bunch of different things. We looked at e-commerce, we looked at buying small businesses. My wife had always been interested in real estate. and. We had, we heard of Airbnb and we just dug more and more into it. And we're like, okay, this seems like something that really works based on my experience looking at a lot of businesses in my then full-time job. And that's how we got started. We started with one unit in New York that we used the arbitrage method, which means we rented it and then re-rented it. Luckily it was her dad's in a, in a, one building in a small building, small residential building her dad owned. And we're like, hey, the person moved out. Can we try Airbnb here? He was like, sure, just don't destroy the place. <laughs> like, <laughs> promising. And candidly, that was, we launched December 27th, 2016. And three months in, I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. Like, there's, I've never seen anything like this in my business career. I've seen a lot of good businesses. That's how we got started. Wow. So first arbitrage unit, Talk, walk me through, how did you even... 
uh, what, what kind of numbers was it doing that made you go, wow, was it three acts, the long-term rental or was it abnormally high? Yeah. I mean, it was by March. So the rent for the place and her dad didn't give us a sweetheart deal. It was like, a, like whatever the market was, it was 2,500 bucks a month all in. And then it's a three bedroom, one and a half bath. It's a very normal place, 30 minutes outside of New York, but you could reach Manhattan with a subway. By March, it was doing like 10K a month in revenue. And so we're clearing like 5K cash for one very mediocre unit. And we didn't know what we were really doing, but I was like, wow, first it's the winter. So it's slower here. Like the summer will be even better. Two, it's like, this little thing can do 5K a month. What if we had 10 of these? That's 50K a month. Like, then I can quit. <laughs> we can all quit. <laughs> yeah. So that, it, it, it wasn't, I don't want to make it sound like we had this like grandmaster plan. If you start somewhere and you have an idea and it's okay, this sounds like it should work, but you never know until you do it. So we're like, right. okay, it was maybe less than 10K of furniture and let's try it. It was a lot of hard work to get up and running, but you got to start somewhere. And then, yeah, I knew that there was something here. Because you shouldn't be able to make five thousand dollars of cash flow for a very normal apartment. Like long term rentals, you might clear two hundred bucks, three hundred bucks a month, maybe if you're lucky. It was like twenty X that. Like you didn't need a MBA from an Ivy League university or being an investment banker to know that there's yeah. something there. Wow. Yeah. Do you think that having the investment banking background helped you in your investing career? I'd say it helps and it hurts. Mm. It's I think sometimes you get I'm very analytical, but sometimes I get too analytical mm. and it like slows you down or prevents action. So I think in a way it's good because I know numbers, I know how to analyze data. I have a lot of the business tools, but what I, where it holds you back, I think in entrepreneurship is because you just overanalyze everything. Cause like you have the tools, right? So you just try to analyze every little thing. And like in six years, I've just learned that like you only can get so far where like you have to just decide whether you do it or not and then go from there, right? Like you can't do everything to the nth degree because one, someone smart like Patrick is going to take the opportunity or two, you just don't do it. No, absolutely. I think there is some benefit to having a, I'm a, I'm an analytical person myself. I come from a product management background. So for me, I overanalyze things and analysis paralysis stopped me from entering the market in 2020 when it was the height of it. And that was my loss. I definitely think that having an ability to just take that risk is pretty effective. Yeah. Uh, it's you know, a funny thing. Like we were talking about <laughs> offline before when you were at Avant say before when I was in San Diego, I actually met one of my old buddies from undergrad. I went to UC San Diego and I didn't realize this actually, but Sean was actually, I knew his brother was in a different fraternity than me in at UCSD. And then I come across Sean actually way back when, I mean, way back when, but I remember his brother. I was like, oh shit. And then you're like, oh crap. It's actually, oh, it's Sean's. I was like, oh my God, Sean's the guy that started Avant say. And then, yeah. So yeah, it was like kind of odd yeah. coincidence. So that, yeah, Josh, actually, Josh, you know, was that Josh Bronner? Josh. Yeah. And then he, he, knew, he was a good friend of my, my buddy, Alan, mm. whose brother was also in Delta Sig. Anyways, it's a bunch of. <laughs> That's cool. Small world because Avanste is a short-term rental company I used to work for. And they, that was a whole thing. But yeah, that's. That was, I saw the numbers. They were doing arbitrage at the time. So I saw the numbers they were doing. And I just knew that this was a space to go into. But, uh, but analysis paralysis, two years later, that's when I bought my first rental. So there you have it. But going back to like your perspective at this time, you bought your first unit. And you mentioned that you're already doing numbers of how much this would be per year if it maintained that kind of level of success. What were you thinking at the time in terms of were you, did you want to exit the job? Like what was your kind of plan at that point? For me, it wasn't – I had you – know, I was making like seven figures for my job. So I, was, I had a good job and I worked really hard to get that job. I had to go to – I went to Cornell, got my MBA, and then I worked really, really hard to recruit and get into investment banking. So it was, it was a like, very high bar to get in. It wasn't like – itching to leave but i knew it wasn't like a long term for me because i just saw everyone ahead of me they just didn't have the best they didn't have great relation they didn't really get to raise their kids they just like, worked right and they, the wives or like the, the partners who raised the kids because you're just traveling and working and i was like I, I just i didn't know it when i first wanted the job but as i got five six years in i was like man i don't think this is really for me uh, but i didn't have a real way out and because the golden handcuffs, but my wife, she was, my wife's younger than me and she worked in fashion in New York. And so it was like, okay, why don't you step one? Let's see if we can get you out of your job first. Mm -hmm. 
So that was step one. So, okay, let's build this to where, okay, like you're comfortable leaving your job so that not as much as the money, but more of this is real here and scalable. It just makes sense for you to spend time to, to build it. So that was the first step. And we hit that pretty quickly. And that was, she What left. was that number, if I may ask? I don't remember exactly, but it was like, we had five units then oh. when we left, when she left. But it was like July of 2017. So it was like four months afterwards. Wow. The, the kind of aha moment. So we were like, okay, let's really put the gas through the metal and really try to scale this. So by like the fifth one, we're like, okay. So she left. And then I didn't leave until kind of 2019. I like dedicated full time to this. So it took me a few more years to get to where I felt comfortable spending all my time on this business. Right. But, on, but the hindsight, probably, if I had I left in 20, had I left when she left, probably would be bigger. My net worth would probably be a little further ahead. Interesting. Likely. Do, likely. do you think that was partly analysis paralysis or would you change it going back at all? Or do you think that you're just okay with how it happened? Well, I, I'm, I'm generally okay. I don't, I'm not a big revisionist. I feel like everything is a dependency on something else. So I don't try not to like, you pull one string, you, you never know it all might fall out. Mm -hmm. I do think that, yeah, the analysis paralysis, I, I, we probably could have moved faster. There are different opportunities that we didn't take. But then there's the backdrop of COVID too, right? And it, mm -hmm. Liz and I talk about it too. It's, yeah, we could have really scaled to like huge um, number and put on a lot of risks, like r draw down our reserves. And we may or may not have, probably would have survived COVID, but would we, would we have been able to play offense in May, June of 2020? Because that was when we really, I would say when we really accelerated was post COVID, three months post COVID, a lot of dislocation in the market, right? People that were over levered, that didn't manage their business properly. They were really suffering, but we understood the business and we had capital and we had a clean mind too. We're like, okay, let's really see if we can build something quickly here because there's an opportunity here. So that, that really helped that COVID, obviously terrible public health event. But from a business perspective, a lot of businesses that were well positioned immediately after COVID, especially Airbnb, especially in real estate, really benefited from that. Yeah. So you know, we were lucky in a, in a way that we were we had the right we were in the right position to take advantage Absolutely. in May June twenty twenty. Absolutely, and I think when there's chaos, there's opportunity, and I think when people are pushed into a specific forced into a specific situation, they adapt. And I think the people that adapted the best were the ones that succeeded. Um, <laughs> I was not adapting. I lost my job and didn't <laughs> really fail there, but it seemed like you did pretty well. So that's awesome. It's mostly luck. I mean, the, the, you do yeah, remind me of this. My, my favorite, one of my favorite lines from Game of Thrones is uh, uh, Littlefinger's line about chaos is a ladder. So. <laughs> I love that. Um, chaos is a ladder. I like that. You got the first unit, right? Let's talk about scale. And you got to, we talked about, you got to five. Um, how did you get to five? Just calling around. Like we had that, we, we had the one to start. We just, so we knew that kind of worked and we went, so we just kept calling around or we just kept growing in that two block radius. Mm -hmm. Okay, this works. So let's just find the exact same thing as close as possible so that we could just copy Replicate paste, it. copy paste. Yeah. yeah. And so at the time, do you still have those units or? Because I know no. New York's tightened up the laws. I'm curious, like, how you adapt with the tightening of the laws and everything changing always in this space. Like, oh. Yeah, that's a great question. Now. That's a really great question. So we started in New York. We don't operate in New York anymore, to, to your point, the rules. One, the rules in second, COVID. COVID really hit New York very hard. So we were fortunate enough to structure our leases and our agreements in a way where we, we didn't, we were able to, we actually basically just moved those all to long-term leases and then took all the furniture and moved it all to Philadelphia. So in Philadelphia, what we version two of our business, we really understood the rules there. We made sure we were in areas that were commercial, that we can get the proper paperwork. We just took, we took all the lessons that we, we learned from all the mistakes that we made in New York. Mm -hmm. So when we launched, when we basically launched a second geography in Philadelphia, we did it with a clean sheet of paper. And so we avoided some of the pitfalls that we that we fell into in New York. So now we have 26 arbitrage units in two buildings in Philadelphia. That Philadelphia also has regulations, but everything is done exactly dot, dot our I's, cross our T's. And then we own six vacation rental properties in the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So we operate completely remotely. We live in New York, we have two kids, and then we've built the business in a way that allows everything to be operated you know, out of state for us. Right, and so, when so you just pivot every time there's any kind of regulatory uh, measure that comes into play, like the one in New York. Oh, well, we pivot at once. I would say we pivot at once, right? We learn okay where 
you really want to understand the rules and make sure if you want to build a durable business, you really want to understand what the rules are, right? Because you can start a business and earn a bunch of money, right? If you're like looking over your shoulder every month, like your business can be shut down at any point. It's not really a business. You have a hustle, right? Mm -hmm. There are other businesses that kind of are offered the same way that probably ought, that make more profit. But the fundamental part, at least what I learned is you really want to find a place where you can really operate clearly in the open, pay your taxes, get your licenses, very transparent because that allows you to scale and have durability. Because the hardest thing to do is like start something else two years later. So like you just run out of energy, right? What were you really, or for us at least, where were you really been able to grow our net worth is like just compounding our capital and time in one thing again and again over six years, like all the mistakes that we made and, and then building more relationships. And that's how you become a real expert in an industry and how you really can achieve outsized returns. Like you just spend a lot more time in it than the next person, all the tricks, all the people so that you can grow and it's defensible. Yeah. The hardest thing to do is you do one thing and then you pivot to something else. And you pivot. I don't understand that you need seven income streams to hit a million dollars. No, you need one. Like you need <laughs> one. Like that's ridiculous. You need one. Do one thing really well for seven years and you'll grow to that number. I guarantee you. Oh my God. I can't relate anymore to that. Like I feel my, I have ADHD. So naturally I'm inclined to try to lose focus in, in every aspect possible. I get bored with things and I want to move on to the next thing. And I've realized the more to money, time energy spent on just this space, short-term rentals, the more outsized returns I've had. I've gotten even deeper to say that the more focus that you get on one market or few markets, the better you get as well. I know people that take any kind of market and you have to build out your team from scratch. Like there's a reason why you bought in the Smokies over and over again. Like you had systems in place, you had every people in place, like the return on time spent becomes more and more leveraged as you dive deeper in. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. There's also the other point, which I'll add, that I think Pope, most people forget, is people think, oh, that's too much risk. Oh my God, you have 26 in one, in two buildings mm -hmm. in one city. You have six, you own all, like you have one, pl you have one city where you own all your properties. Isn't that risky? I would argue it's actually less risky than having six in six different cities or exactly that point. Because like you have no, there's no way you can cover six cities or five cities build great teams in each individual cities, understand their market dynamics, their rules, all that stuff, know the right vendors to use. This is impossible. It's actually safer to have everything in one place because you really understand that market and you really become the expert there. That is your moat. Your moat isn't like the scattershot approach. If you think, if you think one market's bad, you shouldn't be in that market. Find a great market and just scale within that market, right? Focus is going to drive the returns, right? Diversification protects your assets, right? But Focus and terminate, focus on one thing is going to drive those returns for you. Just like in the Smokies, we had this one incident last week where something broke and we call around a vendor and they're like, oh, it's 1200 bucks to fix this. What? No, this doesn't make any sense. And then come back and just say, oh, no, it's $600. We're like, oh, wait, no. All right, we're not going to use you. We use, we use the guy that we always use. And he's like, yeah, it's like a $50 fix. Wow. Like, they just, they, and they know your absentee landlord, landlord. So those, but those are the kind of things. That's a lot that's a $1,200 margin I would have lost there. But it's six, six random cities. I'm like, yeah, I can just fix it. You know, then you don't make any money. So anyways, it's just like a very recent example of how focus in one market um, drives outsized returns. Oh, absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree with like more on the fact that I think it's really risky to be balancing. It's like you're trying to balance six plates. Those plates that are spinning. You have to like <laughs> try to like keep all six. Let's say that like you come to Joshua Tree, right? I'm solely like I'm that's my number one market. And you come in and you're trying to balance six plates in Joshua Tree and you're trying to balance the Joshua Tree plate. I'm gonna take you out all day. If I'm just having one plate to balance, that plate's gonna move super fast and you're not gonna be able to compete. I think it's just exactly. not smart at all to do that so i'm not saying that nobody else should be entering joshua tree market but what i'm saying is if you're looking to be super competitive in that market and see outsized returns it's gonna be a lot harder to start with just yeah one versus yeah there's this person i know it's funny you say that actually there's this person i know i was the only the person but this person has one in j tree mm -hmm. one in the two in the smokies one in the midwest city mm -hmm. one up in tahoe one in big bear and then I was just like, I was being polite and he was asking me for advice. And I was like, I just tell him what my business is. And I was just, but in the back of my head, I was like, mm -hmm. and I was, I was some people that I work with helping them buy Airbnb. And I was like, man, I would never 
teach my students to do that. That's just, and the person has a full-time job and has two kids. I'm just like, wow. I have no idea how you, you yeah, I'm, I'm sure you make a lot of money. I hope you make a lot of money in your job because it's just so hard to manage all that. I, I don't, yeah. I think that's really being very focused is that's the first and most important thing I, I teach people is find one good market and scale. Yeah. How about, that is the path to success. I'll ask you a question <clears throat> in, in your situation. Let's say that you guys decide to, to buy a lifestyle asset. Let's say you want a beach house. Let's just say that a com common scenario. It's a new market. Are you going to be managing that or are you going to give it to a manager? If I was to do, if it really was a true lifestyle asset, like if I just wanted something, I would fine no nah, i probably i wouldn't want to pay 25 <laughs> what i would do what i would do is i would find someone that was in the market that would do it for 10 or 15 but then i would control the pricing mm -hmm. and the guest comp i would control pricing for sure and then probably the guest comps and i would just like the clean like the underground work i would try to i would give someone 10, 10 points on something they would handle all that that's all them but I already have my team. Right? I want to. I want run. I want to run. In, I want to protect my property. Right? I want to run. I want to run in a certain way with the technology that I want mm -hmm. in there, with the revenue management that I have, yeah. with all the back end stuff. But yeah, I mean, the hardest part is just the physical. That's mm -hmm. like super hard that's to hardest. outsource. Mm -hmm. So you have to pay. So I would. Yeah, but I would. So I would overpay someone to like deal with that. Like a house manager, I would hire a house manager to deal with all the physical R and M cleaning. Made all that stuff yeah. and then i would do that i think to your point on we we are we're in contract for our seventh property and we spent 20 months looking for it so this market because we want to buy five or ten there five to ten there right we want to scale the similar smoking portfolio there so that's why it's taking longer which area um, is this oh it's a secret patrick <laughs> okay to, so there's a to, secret market i'll tell you offline yeah it's a secret it took 20 months to find so okay can't give <laughs> it's too much alpha <laughs> once once one closes in that market then there be a go. lot more open to it. Phil and Shell, it's the, uh, yeah. the adage. <laughs> we we got to get a few there before I talk about it. Yeah, so you, so you have this property. You're looking to do the same thing that you did in the Smokies by scaling and getting economies of scale in that market. Yeah, we're in contract on it, so we haven't closed. And I, I'm like super. I'm superstitious. I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to jinx myself. Yeah. But yeah, we're excited. We we're confident we can close and then get it set up. And then we have we, we're eyeing number two and three right now. So cool. Um, yeah. Excited. Sweet. That should be always a, something. That, so yeah. cool. You have so with your portfolio right now. Just want to clarify with this portfolio right now. You live a very comfortable life in New York. Are you and your spouse and your partner? You guys are both out of their job, out of your jobs. Just to be clear, right? You don't. Do yeah, Liz, my wife Liz and I, we live in New York City. Mm -hmm. We both work on the business full time. We have two young kids, two and a half and six months old. Everything operates out of state. No, I would say, like, I mean, we work hard. We both love building businesses and, yeah. and working. I think the, the biggest difference, I would say, is not like the amount of time you work. I actually probably work more. I probably work harder. I don't, I don't think I work more, but I work harder now than I ever in my entire life. But the, 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 the fun part of it is like, one, is like fun. Two, it's you control your own time. Yeah. And that's the biggest part. I don't have to go to the office. I don't have someone like a client or, or someone above me at work telling me what to do and what my when they want to see comments by or deliverable I don't, there's none of that it's like michael decides what michael does and it's just like completely it's a very life-changing principle when you get to decide when you want to work how hard you want to work and when you work for yourself it's this is all accrues to me and my kids so it's just like it's very motivating versus i'm making money for x person right? mm. like, like i'm making money for this client right i'm making money for client x or for managing direct partner y at this firm right i'm not making i get a salary mm. so I, I don't know that's that's how i that's how i that's how i think about the world yeah but it's very it's a very enjoyable a young 44 right? yeah <laughs> what is like what does your life look like right now i know we talked offline a little bit about it but I think you're running your household like a business almost and, and looking at efficiencies. And I just, I, I love it. I relate to it a lot because that's how I think about my life. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And we've taken a lot of principles from, from operating business home, right? Because it's your home is like a business too. It just, it, it needs to operate. So let's say first and foremost, opening a, starting a business with your spouse. I, I, it's funny because most people are like, oh my God, I can never work with my spouse. And oh, that's like crazy. You guys do that. We've actually find a source of strength, especially now that we have kids, we've learned how to like communicate and problem solve by building a business together. And that's what raising kids is, is literally like problem solving and learning how to work together and communicating. 
so I think that's really helped strengthen our marriage and now raising kids. Where there's, it's like really difficult actually young, raising young children. So having that experience, I think, has really helped us. And yeah, like I think just the way that we operate our home, like outsourcing things that like we don't want to do ourselves, so we can focus our time on growing the business and doing things that we really want to do. I don't love grocery shopping. Neither does my wife. I'm making food, but we love taking care of the kids. So I'm happy to change diapers. I'm happy to take him out to the backyard and play, take him to the water. That's super fun for me. Walk the dog. I love doing that. I don't want to go. So it's like we go and we have help that does those things that like we don't want to do. And mm -hmm. so we can focus on time that we things that we like super enjoy. I love playing with my son. I don't mind changing his diaper. I like giving him a bath like that. I don't want to outsource, but like lugging groceries from Trader Joe's, not super <laughs> on my not top of my list. Yeah. I don't really want to do that. <laughs> Yeah, so what are some of the changes you've implemented in your life through, because you said the main goal was control of time. So what has yeah. that enabled in your life that has changed from when you worked at W2? Yeah, so versus when I work as an investment banker, yes. I think the, the biggest thing is I don't I don't have to commute if I don't want to, and I don't have to, tra I don't have to travel. Like I'm always home. I used to travel four or five days out of the week for work, just flying around everywhere. Other private jets and the four seasons are really nice when you're young, like when you're older, like that, like I like being home. And that's first and foremost too, is we decide on the, the strategic objectives of the business and we drive towards those versus other people deciding for us. So just for example, like I can spend the time, whatever time in the morning, like I don't even look at my phone in the morning. When I get up, I, my phone is in a different room. I don't look at my phone. Cause when you're working, like the first thing you do is check on your email messages, mm -hmm. client calls, whatever, right? I don't even look at my phone. I take care, I get up, I take care of my, I make her breakfast, I play with her, I take her to school. And then that's what, after I drop her off at school is when I get my phone and I look at the day. Mm. That is, that is an example. I spend what, and she's fussy in the morning. It doesn't matter. I just like, okay, I'll take the extra 30 minutes, an hour, whatever you want. I would never, I never had that at work. The first thing I did was like stare on my phone, responding to emails, text messages, whatever that was there. And then rushing to work. Oh man, I gotta, okay, I have a nine o'clock call. I have a 30 call. I gotta rush to work. So I'm like prepped. I have everything printed out. So I'm ready to get on this call with this client. No, like my day starts when I want to start, but then when I run from 10 to five, when I pick her up from school, like racing through the day, right? Cause I have 10 things I need to get done, but then I stop at five, right? I pick her up and then I bathe her, play with her, whatever, right? Till she goes down the night. So boundaries, so you get to right? control boundaries and control. You can't boundaries, do that yeah. with a client that is not your, com it's your company's client, you're employed. So like you have, you have some duty and obligation to that yeah. versus if you have your own client or your own business or your own employees, you can decide how you want to, how you want that communication to be structured, how you want that relationship to be structured and you set the expectation correctly. You can't say exactly. the client that's, let's say a big investor in Beijing or something something like in the company and you're telling them, oh yeah, how about you? No, 8 in the morning is not going to work for me. We're going to have to do 10 a.m. Like you can't really have that conversation. I don't think. No, you, yeah, no, you can't. And it, 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 it's very, it's really poignant when you have kids too, because mm. they're so volatile when they're young. Like you don't know. It's like they could wake up and have it like a really great day or they could just be like super cranky. And I feel really bad for young, for parents with young kids because like you really they need you to take time with them and care and let them get through their tantrums and like express themselves and like hang out, like hug you for five minutes. Cause they like, like they really want that and they need that. And I think it's such a disservice that like, when you're like, and especially this is for the dads out there, like in the moms too, they're like, I can't, I gotta get to work. And then they get short with their kids. They like leave it for their spouse or their caretaker. And like the kids, like they, they feel that too. And I just, I don't know, like that was like a really big thing for me. I just, I, I want to be a good dad. Like I really want to make sure that I'm like, I'm there for them. And obviously I, I'm sure I can, there's many things I can work on too, but at least the one that I'm proud of that, that I, I don't have to stare at my phone. I don't look at my phone until I send them to school. So that's one rule for myself. I just I don't, I don't look at my phone until I go to school. Yeah. <clears throat> that's powerful. <laughs> I wake up and I look at my phone right away. So <laughs> you got to put it, you got to put it in a different room. The I know, the easy, I've heard that. Room. And then I stay in bed and I'm like answering emails in the morning. At eight you morning. never get out of bed. And, yeah, you have to get it. Yeah. So, Sorry. No, you're right. No, you're like 100%. That was a big right. one. It's just, I don't know. That's one of those things I have to work on. But I feel like kids force you in that sense too because they are a human being you have to take care of. So <laughs> you can't really just lay in bed. But No, man. They, they, they don't allow you to wake up. Yeah. I feel so like we all have daughter things stuff. to work on. I feel like everyone's yeah. got inefficiencies in their life. And I see it. I'm not blind to it. I definitely understand where I could do better and that's that but yeah so no I feel like you you never 
the journey never ends really because you're always adapting. You're always trying to become a better version of yourself, whether that be a better parent or a better steward of health or whatever the case may be or a great friend or a great partner so i definitely think that like quitting w2 doesn't stop you from having to work on those other aspects of your life it's just a place where you can actually have a better quality of life which allows you to focus on those other things too uh, yeah just control just get back control, control. just getting back control yeah it's hard I'm, <clears throat> I'm thinking about this michael and that's another thing that like crosses my mind i'm curious to your thoughts on this but we you know have you ever thought about being on the other side of the spectrum and instead of working so hard to – because you still work really hard to maintain your lifestyle, maintain your control. Do you think that at any point in life you'd be happy being like let's say a solopreneur that owns a shop, a pizza shop or something, makes really – or whatever the case may be and makes – or solopreneur makes good money but makes – decent money but nothing crazy out of this world and you work like 20 hours a week and you just living a very humble lifestyle and maybe not in new york maybe in a suboptimal area do you think that would be some kind of life that because at the end of the day the reason you have to work harder is and and create more money or more salaries because you've got the lifestyle that you want to maintain now do you think that there would be ever a life where you'd be able to maintain uh, a lower level of lifestyle and just work a lot less. You said balance, right? Yeah, no, it's a balance. I think when you, I, you know, I think I, I'm a, actually pretty, you know, I, we didn't grow up, a, I didn't grow up in, we were immigrants in the country. We grew up in a very kind of disciplined household. So like the material stuff had never been a big thing for me. I, I think once you have kids, though, I do think you really try to strive to do the best you can. A comfortable life. Yeah. And, and I would say like New York, it's not really, it's an expensive place to live. It's optimal and suboptimal in, in many ways. But I think the biggest thing is like all our friends are here. Mm-hmm. All of our relationships are here. Like the people that I have like coworkers, mm-hmm. friends that like we all grew up together in our late 20s, early in you know, our 30s. Like we all, we're all here. Right? A lot of ours are here. If I move somewhere else, I don't, I lose all mm-hmm. of that. And it's hard to make friends when you're, when you have kids and you're older. It's very superficial, right? Because it's your friends are your friends kids so like you just you never can recreate those deep relationships and that's the biggest thing that i don't want to that i don't want to leave here because i very much value my friendships and my relationships and i know i can't replicate that and there is a cost of to maintain that and and it benefits benefits my kids too right like my network is their Mm -hmm. network their kids are going to be my friends kids when they grow up which is why we work really hard to try to see if we can make a life here um i love that (laughs) That's really smart. I actually, <clears throat> that's another thing. It's like when you move to a new city, it's think about inefficiencies of scale, right? Like at a certain point, you know all these people and then you up and leave. I had that in Chicago and I left to LA and I had to start all over. I had to make new friends. It's hard. Yeah, your 20s, right? Imagine like when you're, yeah, like when you have kids too, like it's not like you, have, you don't have any free time anymore. All you do is they're actually, it's all, it's all kids mm-hmm. based. So yeah, it's, it's, and I think it's really hard. When you get older, it's like lo- loneliness is like the biggest as you get older, like that's the thing that like really gets people. They get lonely, right? Like the kids leave, they have a great relationship with their spouse, and there's they're where I, I think <laughs> my guiding principle in life actually is very simple. Is the one thing I optimize for is I want to be. I want my kids to. It's not about money or anything. Actually, it's, I want my kids to visit me when I'm older. Wow. I want them to want to come hang out with dad. Wow. And I think you think about that. What does that actually mean, right? That means a lot of different things to different people. Everyone can kind of frame how, but that, that's how I view, that's how I define my success in life is like my kids come back and they want to hang out with me. Not because like dad has a nice beach house mm-hmm. or whatever. It's, oh, hey, I want to come back and see, hang out with dad and without monetary or whatever, like, they just want to come hang out with me. Like I will be, a, I will have been a successful person that can do that. And so I just try to construct my life in a way where I can do that, where it's like they have a healthy home and I can hang out with them and I have friends that like we all hang out together and we take trips together. And all, this, all those things, I won't get into specifics, but that's how I like, so however hard I have to work to get to that point is how hard I'm going to work to get to that point. Wow. Is that simple? That is, I've never heard it so beautifully said. I've, I haven't like, I thought about that. Like I, I want to be a great dad, right? Obviously I don't have any kids. I don't have any of that, but that's definitely a goal of mine is to be somebody that not only is my parents and, and bless them. I love, I love my parents. They were great parents. And I just, I had a very parental relationship with them. What I mean by that is very, they were my parents. They're not my best friends. They did what parents would do. And I, I never wanted to just be a 
parent. And not to say that we don't have a great relationship. We do. But it's more like I go to them for help. I go like they're they're They supported me my whole life. And I, I love that. But they were never they were not my best friends. They weren't like somebody I could go to and speak about some of these things that I have throughout my life. And I wanted seeing other people's parents and seeing how that structured. I wanted to be that dad is that mm. somebody that is that striking that balance. It's hard. I'm sure you're dealing with it right now, but it's hard to f- strike that balance of, okay, I want to go to them for advice, but also I want to and have that parental relationship, but also that more deeper relationship where I can tell them things and be uh, excited to be in the vicinity of you. So that's such a hard balance. I, I That's yeah it's hard and i think it's different for everyone too like it's di- how everyone grew up and how their relationship with their parents is but but i think just like trying to figure out like what's the one thing that you know that, that kind of what i was talking about earlier like the compounding your time and capital what, what are you really working towards right. and i think working for money is like great for some people which is fine like they want the lamborghini they want the, that's fine everyone teach their own like what i really try to optimize for is like relationships and what is the most important relationship i have is like my wife and my kids right if i can get that right everything else i'll have a solid foundation to like for everything else in my life and even i can be broke if I'm like, okay i screwed up mm-hmm. right and i'm broke i have no money but honestly my kids come back and want to hang out with me i'm fine <laughs> i'm good my wife loves me and my kids want to hang out with dad like man it all worked out it all worked i out. love that I, don't, I love that nothing else really matters that's what I care about. So that's what I was every you know, every me stuff. Like the every me, the invest, all that stuff. It's just a vessel to get me to that spot that I care about. So if that if I get, if I'm already there and then I don't have to like row so hard, then I won't. We'll we'll play that. We'll play it. At, we'll, we'll, yeah. To answer your original question, we'll, we'll play that as it comes. But we're still we're working hard. We enjoy the work too, right? These are the things we just we enjoy this work. I enjoy working with my wife. I enjoy the team that we built. The people that we work with the partners that we have, the relationships I get to build, like with you and meet interesting people like you and Jeremy and all of that, like all get to do stuff together. Like when I see you in San Diego in a few months, it'll be cool. Like, hey, what's up, man? Yeah. We'll have some tacos and beers in San Diego and it'll be really no, fun. No, absolutely. Like, and those things I look yeah, forward to. Yeah, absolutely. It's, cool. and it's, it's really interesting because I feel like I get along with people that are in their 30s and 40s more than I do around my own age. People are just partying. They're doing all these crazy things. I'm like, I can't relate to you. I don't go out. I stay at home. I grind out my my work. I enjoy these podcasts. Like this is the stuff that I enjoy. So it's really hard to relate to people my age, which I would I love to grab a beer and but 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 at the same time, like a lot of people have kids and family, so it's hard to facilitate that. As, but I want to get into the last three questions, Michael. Yeah, this has been great. Last three questions. I just ask every guest one more hypothetical question, and then that's specific for you. And then just the other two, just very basic. So, favorite book. It doesn't have to be book, but it could be a video or a course or anything that you took or watched that really inspired you or allowed you to progress further in your just life. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. It's my favorite book is actually the, a very simple book. It's called The Richest Man in Babylon. Mm-hmm. It just it's a really cool read. It's very short. It's five bucks on Amazon. So I encourage everyone to go buy it. Just some real life lessons around how to manage yourself, how to manage money, how to manage relationships. It was written over 100 years ago. and it, I, I, read, I reread it every year. It takes two hours to read, but it's some very powerful lessons in there. Wow. Patrick, I'm going to buy – I'll buy a copy. <laughs> I'll give it to you when I see you in uh, San Diego. Love it. After uh, on, on July 9th. I actually haven't read that book, but I've had it mentioned before. Definitely. I'd be open to it. So second thing, what in, – in, in a hypothetical situation, let's say you can move your family – and build whatever lifestyle you want and do whatever thing you want in any city. So let's say that friends are going to be there. You're, all your friends are going to move with you. All, <laughs> all the support's going to move with you. You get to pick the, the city that's going to have the best lifestyle benefit for you. On top of that, you also get to pick what career you get to choose, what vessel you get to choose. Airbnb was your vessel of choice, but you get to choose whatever vessel and it's going to financially support your family. How would you build your lifestyle if that was the case? Hypothetical. Oh man, that's a that's a long that's a very deep question. We the two cities we, we lo- like my wife and I really love is first of all, Mexico City. We love Mexico City. It's a great city. We, I would, if I had my brothers, I would, I would love to move there for an extended period of time and live there. I really respect the Mexican culture and the food and the, the, it's, a, it's a great city. Or that or San Sebastian in the Basque Country in in Spain by the water. <laughs> the food's great. People are great. It's nice. So there, if I could 
run being run my businesses, yep. be an investor, raise my kids there, have my friends around, my family around. That'd be cool. Um, but those are two my two very favorite places to to vacation and spend time. Amazing, I love that. You could get a vacation home there. <laughs> what, what would the <laughs> vessel of or your life? Let's say you sold all your Airbnbs or or whatever. What would your thing be? What would you be doing day to day if you could just choose anything? I really, I really actually enjoy the real estate yeah. investing side. Like it's really, it's quite like now it's like fun. I really, it's like a game. Like I really enjoy it. I've just spent seven years now doing it, and it, you know, it fits my personality. So I, I will continue to any commercial buildings built like maybe no. There are pros and cons to the hotel mm, thing too. Right. I think doesn't get talked about as much. I'm just broadly being like, continue to be a real estate investor. Okay. I really, it's, it's a, I mean, build a cool, build something cool. I never, I think that's one thing on my list. I want to eventually build something. Amazing. Awesome. And what does the future for Michael look like? Being a good dad. Just, oh, I just, well, I'm a good dad and good husband. Everything, if, if I've accomplished those things and all the financial stuff and everything is going to all float through and I'll be fine. I love that. <laughs> foundation. You need to have a strong foundation to, in order to create anything. So I believe in that. And strong values also. But that plays into family. Cool. So for the people that want to get in touch with you and talk to you, how can they reach you? I'm very active on Instagram. So find me on Instagram. It's Michael Chang BNB, M I C H A E L C H A N G BNB. Send me a DM. I answer all my me all messages. Yeah. Amazing. Any questions, please feel free to reach Amazing. out. Amazing. Thanks. Thanks for hopping on, Michael. I appreciate all the words of wisdom and, and just everything that you went through. So appreciate you, man. And yeah, thanks for hopping on. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show, Patrick. I appreciate it. And that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to the Patrick Real Estate Show. If you found this episode helpful, please give us a follow and leave us a five-star review. Your support truly means a lot. And connect with Patrick in the show notes below. Until next time.